So I think you really have been uh, uh, able now to digest uh, a very comprehensive examination uh, of uh, the NATO missile defense uh, deployments and the dilemma that they posed, and, and also to listen to some uh, possible uh, benefits of a uh, pause in um, uh, the U.S. decision uh, to delay implementation of Phase Three. So, to I mean, put an awful lot out on the, on the table here, and I know there are people around the room who both have questions and and probably uh, inclinations to uh, to uh, challenge some aspects of the of the presentation. So let me begin because I mean there's a temptation if I call upon Nikolai, uh, I know Nikolai will be able to raise uh, a number of very interesting issues, and I will give Nikolai a chance. But I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to preempt, particularly from some of our, our younger uh, colleagues here who are really beginning their study of, uh, of uh, the issues that some of which are are put by Tutti. I want to give them the chance to ask questions. There. There are no, well, Shay, you're young, but you're not uh, as young as some others are at the table. Okay, go ahead, Shay. You're young enough. Why don't you start? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Um, I wasn't sure if you were serious there. Um, so, very serious. Yeah, so um, it is, uh, I, I guess, uh, basically, you know, one thing you kind of touched on is that uh, uh, these missile defense systems provide, you know, a, a false sense of security. Uh, for countries that have them in, but it, it still is a sense of security, maybe false. They did these <laughs> missile defense systems in there, and they think now we're secure. Um, I guess my question is, uh, you know, uh, uh, if pausing, uh, you know, these deployments is the right thing to do, is is now the right time exactly? Because we have a president who has kind of made statements that he might not defend Eastern Europe. And then the next thing you know, he pauses these uh, deployments of uh, missile defense systems that a lot of these countries think, although falsely, you know, they think that it's very important to their security. So I guess basically, you know, is, is this the right time to pause it? Uh, uh, or, you know, might this just lead to, you know, a greater fear of abandonment by our Eastern European allies? Yeah, that's a good point. I think. Some awareness raising would help. For example, like I said, it seems that many get there's no debate on this in Europe, and and it seems I mean, it yeah it, it seems to many that this can protect Europe from from Russia. So it might be helpful also to to highlight what the what these systems can actually do and. And there are better ways, more sustainable ways to provide security for allies to Poland. So, so I think it's just about how to do it. Of course, Trump is perhaps not the best way to best person to explain this to the Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I think it would be would be more would be wiser to provide them something that can provide actual security rather than something that they think is improving their security while it's actually having the opposite effect. Really so it's right. about how to frame it. Thanks. Sarah. I'm just slightly older than Shay, so thank you. Um, <laughs> that was so interesting. So I just had a question about the linkage between um, the ABM issue and non-proliferation. So I, there's very clearly a link between arms control and the ABM issue, but um, I read a couple of studies recently in doing some research on the CTBT, for example, that mentioned the fact that Russia's ratification of the CTBT was accompanied by some provisions that mentioned ABM in Europe. And so I'm wondering whether you see, I mean, maybe that linkage is artificial, but it seems to be there historically, and I'm wondering whether you see any implications or the non-proliferation regime, if the ABM issue isn't resolved. Hmm. I guess I, yeah, I've been focusing on U.S.-Russian arms control, and yeah, I, I guess I would have to think about it more. I mean, there was this argument that missile defenses could deter proliferation, but I don't mm. think that makes much sense. I don't think Iran 
really cares about the missile defense system and I think that tells a lot about the the system that it's and its motivations I and mean, it seems both Iran seems to be both irrelevant and indifferent to it and it's actually the US officials now the only they are the only ones who keep talking about the Iranian threat I mean NATO already after the Lisbon summit NATO kind of wanted to not mention Iran I, I guess it was because of Turkey anyway um, yeah, I will have to think about the question of yours more about how the link between non -proliferation. Do you have an answer to your own question? Well, no, I don't. I mean, I, I just, I thought it was very interesting that um, there hasn't, in my reading, been a lot of, of recent literature on Russian perspectives on, for example, the CTBD. Um, but the one study that I did read linked the issue of ABM to kind of Russian interest in remaining in the CTBT. And my perception is that that's not a very widely held view, but I was just curious whether you'd come across any kind of implications for US Russian on proliferation cooperation being tied in any way to the ADF issue, even if it's kind of an artificial link that's been constructed. Yeah, that seems actually I hadn't, I didn't know about that. Uh, CTBT issue that you mentioned with Russia, so maybe into it. it, but mm -hmm. but it didn't. Yeah. yeah, I don't see but, the direct link there. No, no, uh, I don't think it's a direct link. I was just curious. No, uh, was well, link. the logical link is that Moscow says it will not reduce nuclear weapons unless uh, uh, missile defense is resolved, mm -hmm. and if you will not reduce nuclear weapons, then it's Article Six. Issue. That's really like the only link that I see. Um, so before I thanks, uh, any other? I mean, I really, I, I we have a, a number of uh, undergraduates who are just beginning their studies here, but I, I suspect that you must have some questions related to uh, Dr. Orozco's presentation. So uh, I'll call on you during the course of the uh, next 30 minutes or so, but please don't be timid, please. Um, I'm actually I'm in the graduate program, the Non-Proliferation and Terrorism Studies here. And I noticed the timing was interesting between um, comments that were made by Medvedev in August 2008, which was the time of the nine, ten day um, Russian incursion into Georgia. Do you feel that decisions regarding the missile defense, the EPA, were made prior to that date, kind of leading up to it, um, as far as the Bush administration's desire to install missile defense in Europe, or do you think that that uh, was an event that influenced um, the decision, you know, to move forward with the EPA by President Obama. You mean the 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 Russian war in Georgia? Uh, yes, August um, 7th through 16th in 2008, and that's the only event that I can think of that's really kind of a, a spike of um, maybe Russian aggression. Um, during the 2000s that might make the U.S. feel that installing a site in Poland would be good? I think it has the effect that it, uh, or it's not my view, it's in some um, congressional research service reports, for example, they, they talk extensively about the negotiations between the Bush administration and Poland and the Czech Republic and, and, and the Poles and the Czechs didn't seem to be completely convinced, also because there was domestic opposition to these plans. But then, after they, uh, in the report, they suspected that the war in Georgia that that kind of have helped them made up their minds that they after that that contributed to the decision and and the agreements were signed after that. So in that sense, it did have like a since you did have a role. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Nikolai. <laughs> uh, I, uh, why don't you uh, kind of become kind of mainstream and, and enter the <coughs> discussion? Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just to fill the time. I hope where the young people can uh, think about their questions. Uh, yeah, I think it was an excellent presentation. Um, yeah, I really would agree with everything. Uh, uh, that you said, so this I have only one question. Uh, 
I'll, but maybe also to be common to expand a little bit uh, what you said. You know, the question is, uh, what do you think about the role of Turkey now uh, uh, that that country seems to be kind of drifting away from NATO, uh, the major kind of uh, complications in relation with the United States, but especially uh, with the Europe, but with Germany now withdrawing from Turkey. Um, so what you think the role of that radar might be and how it could actually change uh, 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 the missile defense kind of structure you know, of, 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 of in Europe? So is that's one question. Yeah, that's uh, an yeah. interesting question because Turkey is that not normally that Turkey doesn't really get much attention, although it has a big role to play with that. Yes. Uh, that big radar that is for that is quite crucial for because it's I mean if the system is is against threats from the Middle East it's responsible for the early detection mm -hmm. and timing is important if they're supposed to inter really intercept the missiles yeah but that's an interesting question if I haven't seen any discussions over that or news about well, that but it's it's an interesting thing I just thing wonder about, whether you've seen yeah. anything. Yeah, it could be considered kind of a another weak link of the system. Mm -hmm. Nicola, I want to press you though. Yes. yes. Okay. Sure. So, um, I mean, Tutti, I think, uh, reasonably has suggested that uh, the pause might have a number of beneficial, mm -hmm. you know, consequences. Um, but I, what I would be interested, I mean, this is both for Tutti, but uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, Dr. Sokov is a former, uh, you know, uh, Soviet and Russian foreign ministry official, arms control negotiator, and uh, someone who, uh, better than most, uh, can uh, kind of put himself uh, inside the, the shoes of, <laughs> of uh, Russian decision makers and, and policy analysts, because he used to wear those, those same shoes. Uh, so. I'm curious about, you know, how you believe that different Russian policymakers might respond. And I don't think there's a uniform Russian policy response here. Um, and so, one of the very specific points, you know, you suggested was how uh, this might impact upon uh, the deployments of Iskander and Kaliningrad. Then there's the question of how this might, if it had some impact, uh, you know, on uh, INF. Uh, issues, and then another related possibility was, you know, how the pause might impact upon, you know, a broader set of interests involving the resumption of uh, uh, nuclear arms control uh, negotiations between uh, Russia and the United States. So, would you like to, to speculate? Uh, All right, Nikolai, and then uh, then I'm here. Yeah, All right. Uh, uh, actually. Uh, this goes uh, directly to the comments that I plan to make, except for the last point, but I can discuss that too. Um, so I think that uh, uh, you're completely right to say that the Russian reaction was uh, exaggerated. Uh, I would uh, uh, take one step actually further and claim uh, that Russia is actually quite happy about that point. <laughs> um, well, if you look back into uh, that chance for, you know, uh, for cooperation that emerged after Obama uh, uh, announced uh, uh, the uh, uh, plans, is actually the Russian military were quite sad. Uh, 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 the reason being uh, that the Bush plans provided them uh, with a great pretext uh, to deploy Iskander missiles in Kaliningrad, or at uh, and take other kind of measures. Yes, and then suddenly like Obama uh, uh, removes that pretext. Yeah, that's pretty sad, right? Uh, so they were quite actually happy when finally Poland got sort of like its way. Uh, I you know, was able to insist first like, on a back three yes, and then uh, 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 the third phase kind of key. Um, oh, finally, said the Russians, now we can deploy these conveyors. 
uh, so it's really like a process that works both ways. Yeah. I would say that um, neither U.S. policy on missile defense uh, nor Russian policy on U.S. missile defense is really driven by missile defense itself. <laughs> um, uh, is if you look at Russian policy, I would actually suggest looking at two uh, developments. And one is uh, the bastion kind of a uh, 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 concept that's no longer actually has that name, uh, but what emerged in, uh, in late 90s, and you know, it's all about creating these highly fortified, very strong kind of, uh, of areas uh, uh, that will protect Russia. And the first, in fact, was created in the far north, uh, very close to Finland, uh, to Norway, and everything. Uh, uh, to protect all the naval bases you know, out there. Kaliningrad Oblasti is the second one, yes, and now they are creating the same Crimea. So you've got three of these like, regions. Uh, uh, so any deployments in Kaliningrad are quite logical and very neatly fall into that strategy. Uh, yes, the second reason is uh, since 1999, Russian defense policy has really been driven by cost by the possibility uh, that NATO uh, might uh, uh, threaten the use of force in the same way as it was used against Serbia in 99. Uh, so they really developed plans to strike at possible uh, bases from which uh, these strikes would be implemented. Uh, and Poland is really uh, the number one candidate for such strikes. So they really needed uh, intermediate range capability, very close to Poland, Kaliningrad is ideal place uh, uh, to, to, uh, to strike at these bases. So is, I would actually claim uh, that deployment of Iskanderian in Kaliningrad <coughs> is not related to missile defense. Uh, the deployment of, Kali uh, of Iskanderian in Kaliningrad uh, was going to continue no matter what. Uh, you know, missile defense is simply a very convenient reason to do that, yes, and the United States and NATO have really provided that. So yes, everyone's happy, actually. Yes, everyone's <laughs> doing what they want. Uh, NATO's deploying missile defense, yes, everyone's happy. Uh, that's like <laughs> a sacred cow uh, uh, here in Washington that has no logical explanation, it's all politics and money. Uh, uh, Russia is deploying its missiles, it's, and everyone's really happy. So why try to resolve something? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's really uh, the underlying of logic of this whole thing. Uh, I'm very sorry. I, uh, you know, that's why I'm, uh, I'm so pessimistic. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I fully agree uh, that phase three should be paused. I simply do not see the political uh, circumstances uh, that would make it possible actually but on both sides. Okay, and I would even say that Moscow uh, would be very sad to do that. Uh, yes, that's a one uh, way to make Moscow sad and to disrupt um, Moscow's plans. Yeah, I'm just not really sure uh, 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 that Washington uh, uh, and some allies in Eastern Europe would agree to that. Uh, so yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, I would um, yeah, actually say that uh, yes, you're completely right when you talk about Russian reaction. Uh, yes, I would simply make one step further. Yeah, that was a very thought-provoking response. But I wonder if in, in Moscow also there are different kinds of groups. And I mean, those who are happy are probably the more hardliner yes. kind of people, yeah, but I would assume that there are also yeah, of course, people of who might be interested in arms control. Yes, I'm afraid that people uh, like interested in, of, of in arms control are a minority. Uh, I would say that, uh, well, in fact, currently it's more in the interest of the United States to pursue arms control. Uh, in fact. Uh, but it's very hard to convince anyone uh, in Washington uh, uh, that that's the case. But the, Nikolai, one could make the argument, it seems to me, based upon what both you and Tutti have just 
uh, suggested that to the extent, I mean, this is a far more sophisticated kind of a policy than I can imagine being conducted you know, in Washington at the moment. <laughs> but uh, to the extent that one wanted to reinforce the, uh, those uh, elements who are outnumbered and outgunned in Moscow today, if one wanted to kind of reinforce institutional advocates for arms control, then the kind of pause that Tudy mentioned would make sense. Yes. No. Uh, yes, I agree with that. Uh, yes, I, it, it may not win the day, but it, it yeah, would be should, yeah, so uh, useful at least yeah, bolstering yeah, for, uh, those institutional advocates for uh, uh, no, that would be very rational of, of approach. And uh, yes, although I remain skeptical, yeah, no, I don't all right, uh, but I would say that it absolutely will not hurt to try. Right. Because if I fully agree with you uh, that pausing the third phase will not undermine uh, the security mm. of NATO. Uh, so if we try, we do not lose anything. Uh, uh, yeah, I also think that it's uh, worth... A chance, it's small, but, uh, but I think it's a chance, and I think uh, we should actually try to, uh, to, uh, to leverage all that chance. But don't you think, the, I mean, if it's going to happen, I mean, I, I, the only uh, circumstances in which I could imagine this developing is that the current administration, or at least the uh, uh, leader uh, in the White House at the moment, uh, decides that the U.S. shouldn't be picking up the tab uh, yeah. for, uh, for this uh, uh, activity, and based upon financial considerations rather than anything more sophisticated, yeah. uh, pulls the plug, which then might actually have inadvertently uh, the positive arms control impact. Well, I don't really quite care how it's all <laughs> uh, uh, justified. Yes, it can be justified that way. Yes, it's the simplest. Uh, yes, I would also say uh, that you uh, made a point there that uh, I liked a lot and fully agree with that. Uh, uh, that to a large extent, the Russian concerns, at least last decades so or during the Bush years, yes, and somewhat later. Uh, were really driven by the fact uh, that the missile defense program was uh, uh, open um, ended. Uh, like it did not have a fixed number of launchers uh, uh, that they planned uh, to deploy and everything. Uh, so if, uh, if you look at uh, of uh, the interaction between the two countries uh, during the Bush years and to some extent later, actually, during Obama uh, time, uh, uh, the Russians kept repeating that uh, we want uh, uh, binding limits of, on the capability of the future system. Uh, yes, and the US response was no way, but it's going to be limited. Uh, so uh, I would actually uh, claim that if, for example, the current plans that the United States has are double, uh, and that uh, becomes like a legally binding limit, uh, that would still be acceptable to Russia. Because yes, uh, a, a limited missile defense system will not undermine Russian security. But it's more about the system that are several times bigger uh, than the current plans. So this is maybe a, a reason why it would be useful if you do a second version or an expanded version of your uh, of your excellent piece, duty, is to also kind of examine how a related but different dynamic is playing out in Asia, mm. because you uh, with the bad there deployments. There are many similarities. Uh, because it also relates to the question of you know where is this going? It may not in fact, uh, represent a, a threat at the moment, but I mean, clearly China also, I mean, Chinese perspectives on this also are, are influenced by Well, if you throw in China, then things become much more complicated, uh, because to a large extent, uh, the degree of Russian flexibility is limited uh, by what's acceptable to China. Uh, given the size of the Russian nuclear capability and the emerging conventional capability, they are very flexible. Uh, 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 
but Chinese key could build the Xavier United States is actually quite small. Uh, so our Chinese do not have the flexibility, and given uh, the nature of the relationship between uh, uh, China and Russia, uh, the Russians uh, cannot really make many concessions. So yeah, yeah, that's kind of yeah, that's complicated. Yeah, and it's interesting how this issue has brought China and Russia mm -hmm. together also. No. But I, I wanted to say about the Iskanders that, um, yeah, there might be other reasons also, and there probably are also that the need to modernize, I guess, is one reason to, to have Iskanders in Kaliningrad. But I think Putin has been very, or, like for Putin, this seems to be a very important issue personally, because, I mean, he's been repeating his concerns about missile defense and Medvedev also for the last 10 years. So I yeah. and and another thing is that I think they have been quite consistent. I mean they have threat they have talked about deploying Iskanders in Kaliningrad for a long time but they actually only deployed as far as I know the missiles last October and that was after the phase 3 began. Well, and Although also, there were some reports that they were brought there and then taken yes, out they also again. said it was a temporary deployment. Uh, 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 your proposal uh, seems to me very advantageous because basically you take the Russians like on their word. Uh, you said that you're concerned about this thing. Okay, we we'll hold this so you don't have uh, a pretext. Uh, to keep it there permanently, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, to replay the situation in 2009, but this time with attention. So let me ask General Gard uh, before Tuti had, had mentioned, I think spoken for more than two minutes, for your comments. said that he agreed with what she was saying. So are, do you concur at the end of the presentation here, General? Yeah, I, I, I agree with her conclusions. And uh, frankly, I am. Uh, well, let me let me back up. When when Bush ordered the deployment of the ground based mid course system and to, to do it in a way that deployed it before it was tested, I actually got forty nine. We were shooting for fifty, but we got forty nine retired generals and admirals to publicly oppose uh, in a full-page New York Times ad the deployment of the ground-based mid-course system. I think the thing is a phony. Now, we've had better luck testing the systems that were presented to us today, but even there, I am highly skeptical of the technical competence of the systems, especially because you can overwhelm them so easily. All the tests we've done have been against a single mock warhead when the defenders know precisely when it's going to be launched, what, what its uh, trajectory is going to be, and we do it when the weather's good. <laughs> um, to me, uh, I might even go further than just to say let's postpone uh, phase three. I think we're spending an inordinate amount of resources on missile defense for very little security. So, Bill, I, that's just a Thank general you, comment. Uh, I, 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 I've been uh, op opposed to deploying, uh, putting so much of our resources into these systems for what I think is buying us very, very little in the way of security. Thank you. Um, let's hear. Here, three. So I think, oh, we have a question. Okay, please. <laughs> Going off the general's comment. Do you want to identify yourself for the group here? Too? Yeah, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> I'm one of the summer undergraduate interns here at CNS. Um, I'm Ian Wilkinson, a senior studying chemistry at the College of William & Mary. 
And my question is going off the general's comments. So setting aside political concerns and concerns about its viability against a Russian attack, if hypothetically the Iranians developed an intermediate range missile within the next year, do you know how much the Block 2A missiles, how much more security they would provide for us and for Europe as opposed to the Block 1B missiles which are currently in place? Would it even be worth the financial and political cost to simply put them there against an Iranian missile? Mm. Well, I don't think Iran could produce an intermediate range missile within a year. I mean, they maybe they 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 could, but it wouldn't. They wouldn't be sure if it works or not. And and uh, would it provide? I mean, Block 2A is supposed to be against intermediate range missiles, but it has only been tested once in February. Like all the other tests have been on the Block um, uh, Block One type. So I mean, that one test was reportedly successful, but we can assume that the same kind of scripted conditions were used there. So I don't think it's reliable. So I don't think it can be like if Iran by some miracle would have an IRBM next year and and the Rouhani would go crazy and, and decide to attack Europe with one missile without a nuclear weapon and they can't produce nuclear weapons then then it might be that it wouldn't even work, but but it's a conventional warhead, so the damage. I mean, it's missile defenses are not usually because they are very expensive systems. They are not built against conventional missiles. Again, although Frank Rose is now arguing that, that that that's also a threat, but that was not the original rationale. It was against nuclear armed uh, ballistic missiles. So I don't think it would, it might not even protect against that. Thanks for the question. Is there again, just I'll add a the word here. Uh, one of the challenges of assessing uh, 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 the capabilities uh, uh, that you're asking about is that the specs are all very classified. Uh, I would actually venture uh, to say that yes, you can probably deploy uh, block 2A of uh, like the same launchers as currently being kind of used in Romania. Uh, so, it's, uh, so anyway, yes, it's much cheaper. Yes, I fully agree with that. The site in Poland has really nothing to do with Iran. I think uh, we've covered a lot of territory uh, uh, this uh, this early afternoon, and uh, we're really appreciative to you, Judy, for uh, giving us this you know excellent uh, and very very comprehensive briefing. And I think we're also fortunate to have the uh, the questions that were were raised during our discussion. I learned a lot, and I suspect you did as well. And so I ask you to please join me in expressing our appreciation. <laughs>